terms of critics, there should be a mandatory turnover. I really think that there should be terms. We can talk about that later. <laughs> I think we should. Well, that kind of that, that, that segues into another sort of talking point that I had written down, which was sort of about um, the kind of food writing that, that, that you do. I mean, there are all sorts of different ways of approaching the subject. You can do it as, uh, as sort of the traditional restaurant critic, you know, the traditional anonymous restaurant critic in this disguise. Um, you can, uh, you know, or do it as a features writer. You can do it as a book author. You can do it, you can write profiles. You can do it as a memoirist, as a doer yourself. And so I'm wondering, as some of the people who are mostly writing, you know, regularly about lots of different subjects, um, how do you, you know, do you, what do you like doing best? Do you like doing restaurant reviews? Do you like doing features? Do you like, how does it, how does that come into play in your work? I'm holding the microphone for the previous question. I guess I'll just say that I absolutely hate reviewing restaurants. Everybody hates restaurant critics. It's very hard to be a hated person. And I hate them. Thank you. I like, I like, can I just go back? I take a little bit of umbrage with what Amanda Hester says about saying that we think she thinks that you should be a doer first. And I think it's worth noting that Amanda Hudson herself was a chef before she became a writer. And I think there's a sort of superiority in, this, in the food media scene if you come from the restaurant world. And I think there's a lot of value to being somebody who is not who does not come from the industry. You know, this is this is a very very silly job to have. Food writing is absolutely fucking ridiculous. Okay, it is. So dumb. It is. It is like it, nobody needs it, especially in a time like this. I mean, like when there's wars and the, the country is shit. It's like, it's, it's just, a, just a silly thing to tell people where they should go spend hundred dollars on a restaurant. You know? So, I but, but it makes them feel better. Sorry, go ahead. But it makes them feel better about all the shitty stuff, like the economy. <laughs> It, it may, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah restaurants do have that, sort of like, that power to make, to make you happy, but you have to, um, but, but, but because it's such a silly thing, I think it's really important that, that, that people get, if you're going to read a food writer, you're going to watch a uh, food report on television, or you know, them on the radio, that they come from a consumer's perspective and not from a chef's perspective or a jam maker's perspective. You know, this is, if there's any work to food writing, to food media at all, it's as consumer advocacy. And to tell people where they should spend their money and where they shouldn't. Okay? In a bad economy, in a good economy, it's really expensive to eat good food. It's really expensive to go out to restaurants. And so that's why it's so important, I think, to have to be a consumer with that. Because I don't think that's expensive. But, you're, but you, that, I, yeah, I, 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 I see what you're saying. I, I, mm -hmm. I would point out that I think that this is one segment of the larger world of food writing. There's the segment that is service journalism, telling people where to go to dinner. You know what? What chef has gone where? This sort of thing. And I'm just wondering if you, if there's other, there are other ways to approach it that are what makes it interesting to you, and make people want to be involved in this silly project. Um, you know, narrative writing. It's all, it's all very consumer. I mean, it's all, it's all, I mean, I would, I would, I think it's going to be challenged. Let's, let's hear what people say. But I think I, in all of these cases, it's going to come down to writing about something that you can talk. Well, here's here's a slightly rosier view. Um, you can think about it too as supporting industry, creativity, um, supporting artists, artisans, people who are incredibly passionate about what they do by being an advocate of those people, even if it's by way of, of criticism. Um, I think, yes, you know, when uh, for us to sit here and talk about food writing while things are happening in Syria, for example, can, you can take that bent and go, oh my, the frivolity of it all. But you can also say that you know what everyone at this table does really helps make Chicago a better city and a better culture, not because we're spewing gems out of our mouth, but because we are writing about people who are doing really interesting, exciting things that are making this city a more dynamic place to live, are making this country a more dynamic place to live, and are really integral parts of, of the culture. And so there's the sort of sheer consumerism aspect of it, and then there's also the you know, doing what you can to support people's passions and endeavors. Yeah. Which is you're, you're doing that right now by coming, attending this event for this publication that's writing about food. 
you're supporting one of the few small industries in America that actually have any hope of surviving uh, this great recession already. Uh, ma manufacturing beer is an important activity, both economically and culturally. You're employing probably 50 people here right now by being at this place. So you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm totally on board with your arguments that uh, this advocacy, this consumer journalism, helps actually uh, point out those people who are worth supporting uh, in Chicago. And by supporting them, you're supporting a bunch of other people that stay employed. Possibly these people will create their own companies to manufacture additional products. Uh, you've empowered them to pursue their dreams. You've, uh, you know, there's so many different uh, multiplier effects with supporting local uh, businesses in that sense. And that's the most important thing about any journalism, is support those ideas and those people in whatever the field is, whether it's uh, peace activists who are trying to stop multiple wars that we in, or people who are trying to start a local farm down the block. Um, sort of speaking to that, I'm kind of different, I think, from the most of the rest of the table because I'm a, a trade reporter. So I write for the people behind the scenes, the people who are producing the food. Um, it's like the less sexy stuff, like, you know, production times and operation and machines that break and things like that. But what I like about it is, I think, just like speaking to the first question you asked about whether you're a writer first or a uh, food person first, I think that they're very interconnected because I was a writer first, and when you're a young writer, the hardest thing is establishing a voice and finding a way that you can speak to others as a writer. So for me, when, it, um, when I found my voice, it was because of food, because I was passionate about it. And I started to realize that I had um, just opinions, and it was starting to come through in the writing. So um, I think that for me, it's more, I'm sort of providing a service to the people in the industry. So I did need to go to culinary school because of that, because I felt that I needed to gain a certain skill set. Um, plus I had been laid off from my job as a financial reporter, which was terrible, so it was a good excuse to say, go, yeah, go do it because you love it. Um, so I think that voice is so, so important to a writer that when you find it, um, to me, I couldn't write about something I'm not passionate about, and I think that's where food and being a writer are so connected for me. But um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> I was just gonna. I, I feel like I'm not making, and I'm not saying this but the right way. But like, for example, a publication like Gray's is not going to tell you where to go out to dinner. I mean, Gray's is looking at using food as sort of the prism through which to look at culture, at history, at at cooking, at nutrition, and whatever it is that the, the writer is trying to kind of suss out through their subject. And so, in that, that's why I got interested in writing about food. I was a general interest writer and reporter, I did a lot of different things um, before I started focusing on food. And I did it because I thought it was a great way to write about politics, a great way to write about culture, and a great way to write about nutrition and hunger, and things that are actually important, and they're not just frivolous. Um, and I, yeah, I, think that, I think that consumer drug service journalism is actually really useful, as you said, because it helps you figure out how to spend your money in an effective way. Um, but I'm wondering about if, if these other kinds of ideas come to bear in what you're doing. I, I need to go feed my meter in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, absolutely, I was going to say is that, um, I, I, that food writing is not for the <laughs> You know, it certainly can't be, um, doesn't have to be. And, um, you know, sometimes in speaking about some of these incredibly divisive um, world issues, that the only place that we can find common ground is at the table. Um, and uh, so I think that while the, the many aspects that we are writing, restaurant re reviews absolutely are very important, um, I absolutely don't think that food journalism should be about being supportive. Um, I think that it can be one aspect of it, but uh, being a journalist is not about boosterism. Um, it's certainly about knowing your audience, and you know, I mean, these are kind of like the basic journalism 101, um, and, uh, and writing to your audience and uh, you know, trying to tell the many stories and sides to it in a unique voice and a unique manner. But uh, sometimes I think that uh, um, food writing these days, and a lot of writing these days, because of the really competitive market out there, 
does tend to be, you know, a little bit booster is something you know, where there is room for yeah, there is room absolutely for critical writing of all kinds, um, without necessarily being um, you know, the uh, vitriolic uh, like, like you know, British school of food journalism. So and um, having said that <laughs> Just to kind of add a little bit of that, I would say what we do at ABC is, I mean, my approach is explanatory journalism. I try to explain things to people and show them things. And one of the advantages that we have is visuals. I mean, being able to show somebody how they actually press the apples at Seedling Fruit Farm and make the cider. Being able to show you how Lucilla up the street today at the farmer's market actually makes her alfajores. That, to me, is exciting. Um, so, yeah, in, a, in effect, we are a booster. I mean, we're talking about this business. We're showing you how they make something. We're showing you, we're hopefully getting you hungry when you watch it. But we just try to explain things to people. So, you know, tell people don't tell us. I, 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 nothing gets me more excited than to sort of show somebody the raw element in the field or in the farm and how it ends up on your plate. That's kind of exciting to me. The same with what, I, what we do at Tasting Table is that sort of explanatory. Um, if it's not good, we just won't write about it. Um, the idea is that everything that you're seeing on, on Steve's program, on Tasting Table, is what you should know as someone who's passionate about food in the city, because it's fantastic. Um, I don't think anyone would, would say that there isn't room for really critical evaluation and reportage and, and journalism as well. I mean, I think that has a place and it's really essential to um, though it's also good to be cynical and, and, and you know self-flagellate occasionally, I think it's also important to to offer restaurant criticism because, like in any genre, be it art, architecture, theater, film, you know there are certain people who who are by guiding the public in, and helping them understand how to evaluate experiences and how to best spend their money and what they need to know as informed eaters, you are helping. Well, the different, the different publications have different mandates, and so that is, that's where you get your plurality of opinions because people are doing different things. We're actually, I think we're going to break in a minute. Did Ed, did you have something to say quickly? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, can take, we can take one or two questions from the audience. Anybody? Yes. I have a question. Um, in relation to like, food writing, what are your thoughts about like food reality? 